HMS Victory is a 104-gun first-rate ship of the line of the Royal Navy, ordered in 1758, laid down in 1759 and launched in 1765. She is best known as Lord Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. She was also Keppel's flagship at Hushant, Howe's flagship at Cape Spartel and Jervis's flagship at Cape St. Vincent. After 1824, she served as a harbour ship. In 1922, she was moved to a dry dock at Portsmouth, England, and preserved as a museum ship. She has been the flagship of the First Sea Lord since October 2012 and is the world's oldest naval ship still in commission. Construction. In December 1758, the Commissioner of Chatham Dockyards was instructed to prepare a dry dock for the construction of a new first-rate ship. This was an unusual occurrence at the time, as the Royal Navy preferred smaller and more maneuverable ships and it was unusual for more than two to be in commission simultaneously. During the whole of the 18th century, only ten were constructed. Then Prime Minister Pitt the Elder placed the order for victory on 13 December 1758, along with eleven other ships. The outline plans were based on HMS Royal George which had been launched at Woolwich Dockyard in 1756 and the naval architect chosen to design the ship was Sir Thomas Slade who, at the time, was the appointed surveyor of the Navy. She was designed to carry at least 100 guns and was established with that number of guns, in practice. Her armament varied from 104 to 106 guns and carronades. In January 1808, the Victory was reduced to a 98-gun second rate, but was reclassed as a 104-gun first rate in February 1817. The keel was laid on 23 July 1759 in the old single dock, and the name was finally chosen in October 1760. In 1759, the Seven Years' War was going well for Britain, land victories had been won at Quebec in Minden and naval battles had been won at Lagos and Quiberon Bay. It was the Annus Mirabilis, or Year of Miracles, and the ship's name may have been chosen to commemorate the victories or it may have been chosen simply because out of the seven names shortlisted, victory was the only one not in use. There were some doubts whether this was a suitable name since the previous first-rate victory had been lost with all on board in 1744. Once the frame had been built, it was normal to cover the ship up and leave it for several months to season but the end of the Seven Years' War meant that she remained in this condition for nearly three years which helped her subsequent longevity. Around 6,000 trees were used in her construction, of which 90% were oak and the remainder elm, pine and fir, together with a small quantity of lignum vitae. On the day of the launch, shipwright Hartley Larkin, designated foreman afloat for the event, suddenly realized that the ship might not fit though the dockyard gates. Measurements at first light confirmed his fears. The gates were at least nine and a half inches too narrow. He told the dreadful news to his superior, Master Shipwright John Allen, who considered abandoning the launch. Larkin asked for the assistance of every available shipwright, and they hewed away enough wood from the gates with their adzes for the ship to pass safely through. Larkin petitioned the Navy for some reward for his decisive action, he having a large family but he was denied. He retired on a small pension in 1779 and died in 1803. Because there was no immediate use for her, she was placed in ordinary, in reserve, roofed over, dismasted and placed under general maintenance, moored in the River Medway for 13 years until France joined the American War of Independence. She was commissioned in March 1778 under Captain John Lindsay but he was transferred to HMS Prince George in May 1778 when Admiral the Honourable Augustus Keppel decided to raise his flag in her and appoint Rear Admiral John Campbell and Captain Jonathan Faulkner. The Victory was armed with smooth bore, cast iron cannon. Initially she carried 30 42 pounders on her lower deck, 28 24 pounders on her middle deck, and 30 12 pounders on her upper deck. 
together with 12 six-pounders on her quarterdeck and forecastle. In May 1778, the 42 pounders were replaced by 32 pounders, but the 42 pounders were reinstated in April 1779. Eventually, in 1803, the 42 pounders were permanently replaced by 32 pounders. In 1782, all the six pounders were replaced by 12 pounders. Later, she also carried two carronade guns, firing 68 pound round shot. In service, First Battle of Ushan Keppel put to sea from Spithead on 9 July 1778 with a force of around 29 ships of the line and, on 23 July, sighted a French fleet of roughly equal force 100 miles west of Ushant. The French Admiral, Louis Guillaret, Comte d'Orvilliers, who had orders to avoid battle, was cut off from Brest, but retained the weather gauge. Maneuvering was made difficult by changing winds and driving rain, but eventually a battle became inevitable, with the British more or less in column and the French in some confusion. However, the French managed to pass along the British line with their most advanced ships. At about a quarter to twelve, victory opened fire on the Britannia of 110 guns, which was being followed by the Ville de Paris of 90 guns. The British van escaped with little loss, but Sir Hugh Palizzi's rear division suffered considerably. Keppel made the signal to follow the French, but Palliser did not conform and the action was not resumed. Keppel was court-martialed and cleared, and Palliser criticised by an inquiry before the affair turned into a political argument. Second Battle of Ushant in March 1780, Victory S. Hull was sheathed with 3,923 sheets of copper below the waterline to protect it against shipworm. On 2 December 1781, the ship, now commanded by Captain Henry Cromwell and bearing the flag of Rear Admiral Richard Kempenfeldt, sailed with 11 other ships of the line, a 50-gun fourth-rate, and five frigates to intercept a French convoy that had sailed from Brest on 10 December. Not knowing that the convoy was protected by 21 ships of the line under the command of Luc Urbain de Bauexic, Comte de Guichen, Kempenfeldt ordered a chase when they were sighted on 12 December and began the battle. When he noted the French superiority, he contented himself with capturing 15 sail of the convoy. The French were dispersed in a gale and forced to return home. Siege of Gibraltar in October 1782. Victory under Admiral Richard Howe was the fleet flagship of a powerful escort flotilla for a convoy of transports which resupplied Gibraltar in the face of a blockade by the French and Spanish navies. No resistance was encountered on entering the straits and the supplies were successfully unloaded. There was a minor engagement at the time of departure, in which Victory did not fire a shot. The British ships were under orders to return home and did so without major incident. Battle of Cape Street Vincent in 1796, Captain Robert Calder and Captain George Gray, commanded Victory under Admiral Sir John Jervis's flag. By the end of 1796, the British position in the Mediterranean had become untenable. Once the evacuation had been accomplished, Nelson, in HMS Minerve, sailed for Gibraltar. On learning that the Spanish fleet had passed by some days previous, Nelson left to rendezvous with Jervis on of February. The Spanish fleet, which had been blown off course by easterly gales, was that night working its way to Cadiz. The darkness and the dense fog meant Nelson was able to pass through the enemy fleet without being spotted and join Jervis on 13 February. Jervis, whose fleet had been reinforced on 5 February by five ships from Britain under Rear Admiral William Parker, now had 15 ships of the line. The following morning, having drawn up his fleet into two columns, Jervis impressed upon the officers on victory, S. Quarter Deck Howe, a victory to England is very essential at the moment. Jervis was not aware of the size of the fleet he was facing, but at around 0630 hours, received word that five Spanish battleships were to the southeast. By 0900 hours, 
The first enemy ships were visible from Victory's masthead, and at 1,100 hours, Jervis gave the order to form line of battle. As the Spanish ships became visible to him, Calder reported the numbers to Jervis but when he reached 27, Jervis replied, Enough sir, no more of that. The die is cast and if there are 50 sail, I will go through them. The Spanish were caught by surprise, sailing in two divisions with a gap that Jervis aimed to exploit. The ship's log records how victory halted the Spanish division, raking ships both ahead and astern, while Jervis' private memoirs recall how the victory's broadside so terrified the Principita Asturias that she squared her yards ran clear out of the battle and did not return. Jervis, realizing that the main bulk of the enemy fleet could now cross astern and reunite, ordered his ships to change course. But Sir Charles Thompson, leading the rear division, failed to comply. The following ships were now in a quandary over whether to obey the Admiral's signal or follow their divisional commander. Nelson, who had transferred to HMS Captain was the first to break off and attack the main fleet as Jervis had wanted and other ships soon followed his example. The British fleet not only achieved its main objective, that of preventing the Spanish from joining their French and Dutch allies in the Channel, but also captured four ships. The dead and wounded from these four ships alone amounted to 261 and 342 respectively, more than the total number of British casualties of 73 dead, and 327 wounded. There was one fatality aboard Victory, a cannonball narrowly missed Jervis and decapitated a nearby sailor. Reconstruction by late 1797, Victory was stationed at Chatham under the command of Lieutenant J. Rickman. In December, unfit for service as a warship, she was ordered to be converted to a hospital ship to hold wounded French and Spanish prisoners of war. However, on 8 October 1799, HMS Impregnable was lost off Chichester, having run aground on her way back to Portsmouth after escorting a convoy to Lisbon. She could not be refloated and so was stripped and dismantled. Now short of a first rate, the Admiralty decided to recondition victory. The original estimate was £23,500, but the final cost was £70,933. Extra gun ports were added, taking her from 100 guns to 104, and her magazine lined with copper. Her figurehead was replaced along with her masts and the paint scheme changed from red to the black and yellow seen today. Her gun ports were originally yellow to match the hull, but later repainted black, giving a pattern later called the Nelson Checker, which was adopted by all Royal Navy ships after the Battle of Trafalgar. The work was completed in April 1803, and the ship left for Portsmouth the following month under her new captain, Samuel Sutton. Nelson and Trafalgar, Vice Admiral Nelson, hoisted his flag in victory on 18 May 1803, with Samuel Sutton as his flag captain. The ship was not ready to sail, however, so Nelson transferred to the frigate Hampton on 20 May and left to assume command in the Mediterranean. Victory later sailed to Erishan to serve as flagship to Cornwallis, but was not required and so went to the Mediterranean in search of Nelson. On 28 May, Captain Sutton captured the French Embuscade of 32 guns, bound for Rochefort. Victory rejoined Lord Nelson off Delon, where on 31 July, Captain Sutton exchanged commands with the captain of Amphon, Thomas Masterman Hardy and Nelson raised his flag in victory once more. Victory was passing the island of Toro on 4 April 1805, when HMS Phoebe brought the news that the French fleet under Pierre Charles Villeneuve had escaped from Toulon. While Nelson made for Sicily to see if the French were heading for Egypt, Villeneuve was entering Cadiz to link up with the Spanish fleet. On 9 May, Nelson received news from HMS Orpheus that Villeneuve had left Cadiz a month earlier. The British fleet completed their stores in Lagos Bay, Portugal and, on the 11th of May, sailed westward with ten ships and three frigates in pursuit of the combined Franco-Spanish fleet of 17 ships. 
they arrived in the West Indies to find that the enemy was sailing back to Europe, where Napoleon Bonaparte was waiting for them with his invasion forces at Boulogne. The Franco-Spanish fleet was involved in the indecisive Battle of Cape Finisterre in Fog Off Ferrell with Admiral Sir Robert Qualder's squadron on 22 July, before taking refuge in Vigo and Ferrell. Calder on 14 August and Nelson on 15 August joined Admiral Cornwallis's Channel Fleet off Ushant. Nelson continued on to England in victory, leaving his Mediterranean fleet with Cornwallis who detached 20 of his 33 ships of the line and sent him under Calder to find the combined fleet at Ferrell. On 19 August came the worrying news that the enemy had sailed from there, followed by relief when they arrived in Cadiz two days later. On the evening of Saturday 28 September, Lord Nelson joined Lord Collingwood's fleet off Cadiz, quietly, so that his presence would not be known. Battle of Trafalgar After learning he was to be removed from command, Villeneuve put to sea on the morning of 19 October and when the last ship had left port, around noon the following day, he set sail for the Mediterranean. The British frigates, which had been sent to keep track of the enemy fleet throughout the night, were spotted at around 1,900 hours and the order was given to form line of battle. On the morning of 21 October, the main British fleet, which was out of sight and sailing parallel some 10 miles away, turned to intercept. Nelson had already made his plans to break the enemy line some two or three ships ahead of their commander-in-chief in the center and achieve victory before the van could come to their aid. At 0600 hours, Nelson ordered his fleet into two columns. Fitful winds made it a slow business, and for more than six hours, the two columns of British ships slowly approached the French line before Royal Sovereign, leading the Lee Column, was able to open fire on Fugex. Around 30 minutes later, victory broke the line between Bucentaura and Redoubtable firing a treble shotted broadside into the stern of the former from a range of a few yards. At a quarter past one, Nelson was shot, the fatal musket ball entering his left shoulder and lodging in his spine. He died at half past four. Such killing had taken place on Victory's quarterdeck that Redoubtable attempted to board her, but they were thwarted by the arrival of Eliab Harvey in the 98-gun HMS Temeraire, whose broadside devastated the French ship. Nelson's last order was for the fleet to anchor, but this was countermanded by Vice Admiral Collingwood. Victory suffered 57 killed and 102 wounded.